steel design, compression members, local buckling, Most standard steel sections can be viewed as having two or more cross-sectional elements. For example, a wide flange section has two flange plates and one web plate, totaling three cross-sectional elements. Similarly, a channel section combines two flanges and a web. A single angle consists of two legs, each being a rectangular plate. When all the elements in a compression member buckle in unison, we refer to it as overall buckling. We discussed this type of buckling in previous lectures. For example, the overall buckling of a column having a wide flange section looks like this. Buckling could also happen locally in only one of the elements of the cross section, like this. In this case, only one of the flanges of the column has buckled. We refer to this phenomenon as local buckling. Depending on the dimensions of these plates, the column can become susceptible to local buckling. That is, the member can buckle locally before the onset of the overall buckling. In such cases, since local buckling renders a part of the member's cross-section ineffective in resisting the compressive force, the overall buckling strength of the column, given by the AISC equations, must be reduced. In this lecture, we examine the AISC local buckling provisions for the design of compression members. Let's start with an overview of the formulation that underlies local buckling. Consider a thin plate in compression. Why a thin plate? because most standard steel sections are composed of thin plates. The general equation that describes the deflection of such a plate can be written as, in this equation, delta is the partial derivative operator, W is the deflection function, N sub X is the critical buckling load per unit width of the plate, and D is the stiffness term. For a thin rectangular plate, D equals, where E is the modulus of elasticity of steel, T is the plate thickness, and mu is Poisson's ratio. Assuming the plate is simply supported along these two edges, the solution of this fourth order differential equation can be written as, in this equation, alpha and beta are Constants C1 and C2 are to be determined using the plate's boundary conditions. At the simply supported edges, two boundary conditions can be imposed. At y equals plus or minus b over 2, deflection, w, is 0, and bending moment equals 0. So, we get these two equations. In matrix form, these equations can be written as This linear system of equations has a trivial solution. C1 equals C2 equals 0. This solution results in a zero deflection function, which does not help us determine the plate's buckling load. Fortunately, there is also a non-trivial solution to the problem. The non-trivial solution exists when the determinant of this matrix is zero. This determinant expression simplifies to, since this term cannot be zero, and this term is always greater than or equal to one, for the determinant of the matrix to be zero, this term must be zero. For the cosine of beta times b over 2 to be 0, beta times b over 2 must be an odd multiple of pi over 2. If we use the smallest odd multiple of pi over 2, we get beta equals pi over b. So, we can rewrite this equation as Solving for n sub x, we get 
Since n sub x is force per unit width of the plate, we can rewrite it as where F sub CR is buckling compressive stress and T is the thickness of the plate. And since D equals, our equation can be written as, this equation simplifies to where K is. Interestingly, we can view K as the coefficient that defines the plate's boundary conditions. For example, if the plate is simply supported along both edges parallel to the direction of the load, as shown here, regardless of the values for b and l, given that m is an integer, the smallest value for k becomes 4. So, the equation for critical buckling stress can be written as if the plate is fixed along one edge and free along the other edge, half the flange is an I-shaped column, is an example of such a plate, the smallest value for K can be determined to be 1.277. So, for the flange of such a section, the critical buckling stress can be written as the web of an I-shaped section can be viewed as a plate fixed along both edges parallel to the direction of the compressive force. The K value for such a plate is 6.97. So, the critical buckling stress for the web plate can be written as... Let's have the buckling equation expressed in terms of K for now. Since we don't wish for the plate to buckle before the material's yield stress is reached, we can write... This equation states that we wish the plate reaches its yield stress before it buckles. We need to introduce a safety factor in this equation to allow for uncertainty in the stress values. Let's use a factor of safety of 2. Since Poisson's ratio, or mu, for steel is 0.3, we can rewrite our equation as or solving for the width to thickness ratio, we get we denote the width to thickness ratio of the plate element as lambda. This expression indicates that if lambda is less than or equal to this quantity, local buckling does not occur before the column's overall buckling. We can use this expression to determine the limiting width to thickness ratios for different plate boundary conditions. Let's refer to the limiting width to thickness ratio as lambda r. For columns with an I-shaped cross-section, we take half of each flange as a plate that is free along one edge and restrained along the other. Lambda for this element equals BF over 2 TF. If we assume the restrained edge is fixed, as was mentioned previously, a K of 1.277 can be used. However, since the web may not fully restrain the half flange, the AISC manual uses a K of 0.7 to determine lambda R. For flanges of I-shaped sections, lambda R equals For the web of the section, lambda equals H over TW. Since both edges of the web plate are restrained, the AISC manual gives a lambda r of 1.49 times the square root of E over F sub Y. This value is based on a K of 5.0. The limiting width to thickness ratios for various cross-sectional elements are given in table B4-1A of the AISC manual. Let's go through a few examples. Consider a column with a standard W8 by 21 cross-section. This section has a flange width of 5.27 inches, a flange thickness of 0.4 inches, a web thickness of 0.25 inches, and an overall depth of 8.28 inches. Assuming A36 steel, we wish to know if local buckling controls the design of the column. 
The flange width to thickness ratio is the limiting width to thickness ratio is since lambda is less than lambda r, local buckling of the flange does not control the design. Let's check the web plate. Note that the width of the web equals the overall depth of the section minus two times the thickness of the flange. And lambda r for the web equals since lambda is less than lambda r, local buckling of the web does not control the design. A standard section is called a non-slender element section when all the cross-section elements satisfy their limiting width to thickness ratio. So using A36 steel, W8 by 21 is a non-slender element section. Since non-slender element sections are not susceptible to local buckling, there is no need to adjust or reduce the overall buckling strength of the column. Consider a column having the L 8 by 4 by 1 standard section. The length of the column is 7 feet. We wish to determine if local buckling controls the design of the column. Assume A36 steel. Although the section has two unequal legs, we only need to consider the longer leg, since it has a larger width to thickness ratio. So, the controlling lambda for the section leg equals 8 inches over 1 inch, or 8. Lambda r for legs of angles is, since lambda does not exceed lambda r, we can conclude that L8 by 4 by 1 is a non-slender element section, which means local buckling does not control the design of the column. Suppose the column uses a thinner standard section, L8 by 4 by 1 half. Let's see if this qualifies as a non-slender element section. The width to thickness ratio of the longer leg of the angle equals 16. Since lambda is greater than lambda r, we need to consider the effect of local buckling on the overall buckling strength of the column. We refer to sections that don't satisfy this condition as slender element sections. So, L8 by 4 by 1 half with a yield stress of 36 ksi is a slender element section. Recall that the design buckling strength of columns can be written as where phi equals 0 0.9. F sub CR is the column's overall buckling strength to be determined using AISC equations E3-2 and E3-3. And A sub G is the gross cross-sectional area of the section. For slender element sections, the buckling strength equation becomes where A sub E is the effective area of the cross-section. The local buckling of a cross-sectional element renders a part of the element ineffective for resisting the overall buckling of the column. To determine the effective area of the cross-section, we need to subtract the ineffective area from the gross area. For example, in the case of the standard L8 by 4 by 1 half cross-section, since the long leg of the angle is susceptible to local buckling, we need to use a plate width smaller than 8 inches for determining the effective area. Let's refer to this reduced plate width as B sub E to be determined using AISC equations E7-2 and E7-3. In these equations, F sub EL represents elastic local buckling stress. Coefficients C1 and C2 are given in table E7-1 of the AISC manual. A minute ago, we calculated lambda and lambda r values for the long leg of L8 by 4 by 1 half. They are... From AISC table E7-1, we get these values for C1 and C2. 
So, F sub EL equals 50.91 KSI. Substituting the known values in these equations, we get to determine B sub E, we need to know F sub CR. This is the overall buckling strength of the column, which can be determined using AISC equations E3-1 and E3-2. Since we discussed and illustrated the use of these equations in previous lectures, I will only present the result here. F sub CR equals 26.18 KSI. This value is based on the assumption that the column is pin connected at its ends. So the equations for B sub E simplify to, since this quantity evaluates to 14.97, we must use this term to determine B sub E. B sub E equals 7.73 inches. The effective area of the cross section can be calculated using this expression. Hence, the overall flexural buckling strength of the column equals. We will continue our discussion on local buckling in the next lecture. Here are a few exercise problems based on the material we have covered so far.